does this approach change outcomes? Does it matter? What, what's the evidence? And it's building. And it's actually, uh, what's interesting is looking both in the surgical literature where some of this work is done, as well as, I'm going to show you some work in septic shock uh, patients, we're beginning to see really interesting sort of consistency and outcome. This is an example of a surgical trial, the Fedora trial that was performed in Europe. And um, this was looking at about uh, a little over 400 patients uh, where they used goal-directed therapy or used stroke volume change to guide fluid administration in the, in the operating room as well as in the perioperative period. And when they used this approach, what you'll see is they saw a reduction in AKI. Uh, they also saw a reduction in ARDS and cardiac pul uh, cardiopulmonary edema, so pulmonary symptoms. Uh, and likewise, a uh, reduction in pneumonia. So I want to hold on this because these two, um, two organ systems, renal and pulmonary, are what we're seeing consistent across this approach with improvement in outcomes. In the surgical literature, there's also discussion about uh, improvement in surgical site infections, uh, you know, probably uh, in part due to edema uh, and edema formation at the surgical site and, and wound breakdown. And then there's also some uh, indication about early re return of bowel function in these patients. But the, the main thing I want to focus on here is both the renal and pulmonary, because we see that crossover uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, ICU population as well. So this was a study, a single center retrospective study done at the University of Kansas a while back. And they looked at, uh, frankly, as they rolled out this approach to guiding their fluid management uh, in their septic shock patients, they simply looked at uh, you know, the patients that received this therapy versus alongside the ones that did not. And what they saw, again, in this retrospective uh, single center study was that in patients where they used stroke volume to guide fluid management, they saw reduced fluid balance at 72 hours. And that was a difference of 5.3 liters positive in their routine uh, care versus using uh, the uh, stroke volume to guide their fluid therapy, deciding between pressors and um, and fluid, they were only 1.7 liters positive. This, what they also saw was a reduction in ICU of 2.9 days, uh, reduced pressure use uh, by 32 hours, uh, and they saw reduced mechanical ventilation. This was cut in half, uh, the relative risk was cut in half. And then the other thing that I think was most, uh, also very interesting in this, was that they saw less dialysis and renal replacement therapy required. 19% in their uh, standard care group, down to only 6.25 in their treatment group. Um, and of course, overall in their patients, they saw 53% of them were fluid responsive, coming back to this 50% number. And if you really, if you don't check uh, these patients to understand whether or not they're fluid responsive, you really can't predict this by other, uh, by other mechanisms. So this was the retrospective study. Um, and what this is really hitting on is uh, interjecting into the way that we take care of patients. And of course, the first question is always, you know, do I have a perfusion problem? Do I have an impending perfusion problem? Today, we use blood pressure a lot to measure that. And I'm going to tell you, I think there are probably some pressure, some, some challenges with that. I think flow-based uh, measures are probably a better adjunct to certainly bring in and use uh, when you're thinking about perfusion, because blood pressure can be sympathetically driven. It, 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 blood pressure does not necessarily equate to blood flow, and, and that's what's certainly important when it comes to perfusion. Not that blood pressure is unimportant, but it's not the end-all and be-all. And so I think we need to be thoughtful about how we're we measuring you know, perfusion. But that's the state of the art today. But today, if, if you don't believe you have a perfusion problem, sit tight. You, you really don't need to expand blood volume. You don't need to do anything. If you do have a perfusion problem, we always go to fluid, okay? And the issue what we're talking about today is the only difference in this is now we have a technique that says, you know, will fluid work? Is fluid likely to be uh, an effective therapy? If it is, then, then by all means, you can proceed with fluid. If it is unlikely to be beneficial, then you probably need to be thinking about advancing depressors or onto ionotropes uh, if, you, uh, if, if that's indicated. So... One of the things that uh, we did recently was we embarked on a multicenter uh, study, uh, prospective randomized study, to look at this in septic shock. And this was called the uh, FRESH study, uh, Fluid Responsiveness and Evaluation in Sepsis, Hypotension, and Shock. Uh, this was uh, led by Ivor Douglas, and we uh, performed this here in the U.S. as well as in Canada. And the high-level takeaway uh, was that the use of dynamic assessments, a passive leg raise, 
to guide fluid administration appears to improve the outcomes for septic shock patients compared with usual care. The other thing also is that using this approach, certainly we did not see any safety signals and it was able to generate a lower net fluid balance uh, alongside the reductions in risk and renal failure, um, a risk of renal failure as well as respiratory failure uh, in the study. So we appear to, to show certainly an improvement in outcomes and certainly we don't uh, have uh, any uh, uh, safety signals that arose in this that would give you pause. Um, so why is FRESH important? It's really the first randomized controlled trial to demonstrate improved outcomes using dynamic measures in septic shock. Uh, and it builds on physiologic studies and retrospective studies, both in surgical patients, as well as uh, some uh, limited studies in septic shock. Uh, as I said, we uh, perform this at uh, 13 sites uh, here in the US and the UK. Uh, we had a, uh, it was a great group, uh, investigator group, uh, and uh, this study was just published this past fall uh, in CHEST in October uh, of this year. So what did it show? What we saw was a decreased 72-hour fluid balance. Okay? The treatment group uh, was only 0.65 liters positive versus the control group a little over 2 liters positive. So we saw a fluid reduction of about 1.3 liters in the treatment arm. Uh, and this was uh, statistically different between the two arms of the trial. We also saw uh, a reduction in renal replacement therapy, a combination of dialysis as well as um, ultrafiltration. And similar to what was seen at KU, uh, we saw the control group was about 17.5% uh, initiation of uh, renal replacement therapy. In the treatment group, we only saw this in about 5.1% uh, of patients. Uh, likewise, we saw a reduction in mechanical ventilation uh, with less respiratory uh, impact. The control group, about 34% of the patients were intubated, where in the treatment group, only 17% of the patients were intubated uh, during the study. We also saw a strong trend towards a reduction in length of stay, although it did not reach statistical significance in this trial, with a p-value of 0 0.01. Uh, the control group was at six days, and the treatment group is down to about three days. Um, the other thing that was interesting that we saw was when we looked at a composite uh, measure of discharge home versus uh, either death or discharge to um, uh, augmented care, uh, we had a higher percentage of patients being discharged home. In the treatment group, roughly 63.9% of the patients went home uh, directly from, the, from this hospitalization, where in the control group, only 43.9% uh, were discharged uh, to home. So we saw uh, definitely a difference in uh, discharge location uh, between the two arms. So the study, uh, while I went through the outcomes, the study was really, we looked at 124 patients. We had two to one randomization in the treatment arm to enrich uh, the treatment arm. Uh, and we had 41, uh, 41 patients in the usual care arm. Um, we enrolled these patients in the emergency room with refractory uh, septic shock uh, prior to the administration of uh, three liters. Uh, so we wanted these patients enrolled uh, prior to a full three liter of administration because we wanted to make sure we were having impact on fluid management after that. Once they were enrolled, passive leg raise was used to assess any additional resuscitation decisions, either fluid or pressors. Uh, and that uh, carried out over the next 72 hours in the ICU or until ICU discharge. And we were really using passive leg raise to help guide the clinical decision of, do I give fluid or do I give pressors? And so I'll take you through the protocol uh, and sort of show you a little bit what that was. And while this is a little bit of an eye chart and it's hard to read, you'll see that the um, step into this decision algorithm was really a clinical decisions made to treat the patient with fluid or vasoactive medication. So, the clin clinician at the bedside was making the decision that they wanted to uh, administer either fluid or pressors uh, that they believed they needed to resuscitate the patient. We used uh, mean arterial pressures of less than 65 or systolic less than 90, trending lower. Uh, urine, lactate could drive this decision. And you'll see that um, it was basically a very broad inclusion into this. So once that decision was made, we asked that a passive leg raise be uh, performed. And if the stroke volume change was greater than 10%, you would proceed down the fluid arm. Uh, likewise, if the stroke volume change was less than 10%, you were unlikely to respond to fluid. Uh, we asked you to titrate vasopressors. 
And vasopressors in this case uh, were uh, primarily norepinephrine uh, was used uh, as is, I think, you know, more uh, common clinical practice when it comes to septic shock. You'll see that we allowed crossover in this and we asked with the fluid arm that um, after you passed either 500 or a liter that you would please you know, repeat the passive leg raise to make sure that you continue to be fluid responsive. Likewise, with norepinephrine, a little bit of beta effect, we wanted to make sure that if you were proceeding down that arm and you titrated up um, your vasopressors, uh, that you also continue to understand whether or not you were fluid responsive and uh, not just simply blindly uh, enter one arm. So there was crossover between the two arms based on uh, coming back and assessing fluid responsiveness. So as I said, what we saw was a reduction in fluid balance at 72 hours. Uh, we also looked at, as we said here, length of stay, uh, the number of days with ventilator use and vasopressor use. The main thing here I wanted to show with the forest plots, as we look at all of these, you know, certainly nearly all of the secondary outcomes and the other issues that we were looking at tended to favor the intervention group as opposed to the standard care group. And so um, certainly we saw a trend, uh, you know, towards uh, improvement in these sides, not only in length of stay in the hospital, um, you know, but when we also looked at fluid, you'll see that that hit statistical difference with this. When we included pre-induction, uh, pre-trial uh, fluid um, at both amount of fluid given as well as uh, fluid balance, um, you know, we were really looking at less uh, fluid being administered, uh, you know, driven by the, uh, the treatment algorithm. Uh, here, looking at additional uh, outcome measures as we looked in the trial, looking at serious adverse events, um, looking at uh, combination of MACE events, uh, MACE or death, as well as discharge locations and readmissions. All of this tended to favor uh, the uh, group uh, that underwent intervention. Uh, actually, this, uh, this point here, which is favoring the, um, uh, the standard care, is a, a positive readmission rate. Here, it's negative readmission rate. So you were, if you were you're more likely to be admitted, uh, you know, trending here uh, if you uh, were in the uh, uh, in the in the uh, standard of care arm. So, when you're certainly looking at safety signals, and that everything tended to line up, as I said, and other signals as well tended to line up on 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 par, you know, with the uh, intervention group. One of the pieces of evidence I would just want to bring up here: this was an economic analysis that was done back on that retrospective trial at the University of Kansas. Uh, and they did an economic analysis, and most of this economic value is driven by the length of stay, uh, mechanic reduction in mechanical ventilation, and reduction in, um, in renal dialysis and renal replacement therapy. Uh, the University of Kansas, uh, in their economic analysis, came up with a savings per treated patient of about 14000 almost $15,000 uh, per patient uh, treated. And the only point in bringing this up is that when you look at the outcomes here, we haven't done a, a formal economic analysis on fresh, but certainly the outcomes are very similar, and we would expect uh, these economic you know, values to hold uh, as well. So certainly as, as what, we're, what we're seeing here, I think the, the trend towards the outcomes, um, not only are we seeing positive clinical outcomes, but these also drive, uh, in all likelihood, you know, significant underlying economic value as well. So what are the key takeaways from FRESH? I think um, at a high level, what we're saying is that uh, we've demonstrated here, I think in a study that dynamic measures, their use in shock is safe. Um, it does appear to reduce fluid balance at 72 hours and the amount of fluid actually administered. And we're seeing improvement in outcomes, certainly in less mechanical ventilation and less renal replacement therapy. And more of these patients are being discharged home. Uh, this is, again, sort of based on and, and built upon other literature, uh, certainly confirming what was seen at the University of Kansas and building on surgical literature and the economic outcomes that we saw at, at the University of Kansas, certainly based on the similarity between the trials. Uh, some of these may, may transfer over to FRESH as well. I think the uh, FRESH trial also raises a couple of very interesting questions. And one of the things is when we look, actually look at the fluid difference between the FRESH study and other studies that have been done, if you actually look at the fluid difference back uh, earlier, we were about 1.3 liters different between the two groups on average. Uh, this is down from what we saw at the University of Kansas, about 3.5 liters. And what's interesting is when you actually look at some of the surgical studies, such as Fedora and others, 
the total amount of fluid is very little uh, difference between the two control groups or between the two groups, the treatment group and the control group. And I think what we're actually starting to see perhaps, okay, and this is a question I think to be explored, is, is it not so much how much, is it not only important how much fluid we give, but the patient's status at the time in which we give it. So if we're giving fluid to a patient that is not fluid responsive and not able to handle it in improving perfusion, they're simply increasing lung water or interstitial edema or venous pressures to the kidney. You know, is that the timing of fluid, is it equally as important matching that to their physiology? Um, and so I think that's something, you know, a further area to be explored and understand. The other thing I do think we need to be very thoughtful about, this construct that certainly I was taught as a medical student and uh, some of my colleagues I think still tend to adhere to, this, this concept of, well, load them up, you can always take it off later with Lasix. I, I think what we're seeing is that is indeed not the case. And actually there's data within FRESH that tends to support that too. Because the fluid removal in the, treat, in the control group within FRESH was actually more aggressive than it was in the treatment arm. So there was, you know, diuretics tend to be used more in the, um, in the, in the uh, control group. Certainly renal replacement therapy was used more. And despite this effort, what we saw was, you know, these patients did not necessarily do better uh, when it came to mechanical ventilation uh, than patients that, um, you know, uh, patients were treated appropriately up front. So I think, you know, there's certainly more work to be done in this area, uh, more questions to be answered, but I think that becomes a, you know, sort of exciting area as, as we move forward. So how does all this fit with COVID? And is, is COVID, you know, really uh, a different animal, um, you know, than, and how should we be thinking about fluid in, in COVID? And I think what's interesting is to watch, uh, our learn, uh, watch us as a medical community learn so quickly and, and adapt with this disease. Certainly back in early, in March of 2020, um, the World Health Organization in their, um, in their recommendations were recommending the use of dynamic measures and fluid responsiveness to guide you know, volume administration. Uh, and we're rec recommending passive leg raise and, and serial stroke volume measurements. Um, I think also one of the things we saw very early in COVID was uh, you know, our use of high PEEP and um, uh, you know, pulmonary measures uh, to treat this certainly may have been contributory towards some of the higher renal failures that we were seeing in the case as well when you get into the renal perfusion and hemodynamics associated with high PEEP. Um, the other thing is we think about you know COVID as being viral sepsis, uh, we also need to be thinking about you know and, and looking at uh, how our fluid management transfers over to these patients I think is really critical. Uh, certainly when we look at the more recent surviving sepsis guidelines uh, with COVID-19 uh, there, you know, it is a suggestion here that, again, we should be thinking about fluid responsiveness as we treat these patients with volume and volume resuscitation. And uh, certainly we should be thinking about crystalloids and recommending probably the balanced use of balanced crystalloid solutions uh, in these patients as well. Mm -hmm.